Welcome to another edition of RCE. I am host Brock Palin, and I have with me my co-host Jeff Squires from Cisco. Greetings. How's it going, Brock? All right. Uh, today we are speaking about the Torque Resource Manager. We have with us Josh Budikofer from Cluster Resources. Josh? Hi. And we have Ake Sandgren from HPC2N. Hi. So I, I have to ask before we even start here, this is kind of a traditional thing in the podcast here. I'm, I'm absolutely positive that we're pronouncing your name wrong there. Could you, could you tell us how to pronounce your name properly? Oke Sandgren is the correct okay. one. But... All right. Well, we'll try, but we are ugly right. Americans, so we'll, we'll probably get us <laughs> wrong and you'll have to forgive us for that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, guys. So um, first, can one of you give us a quick rundown on exactly what Torque is for people who have maybe heard of it but not sure exactly what it does? Um, I guess I can uh, talk about that. Um, Torque, as you said, is a resource manager. So um, in the HPC industry, resource managers are uh, their middleware um, and they sit above the operating system. They allow jobs to be submitted uh, usually into some sort of queues or a batch system and then those jobs are migrated out to compute hosts or compute nodes that are usually also running a daemon that's part of the resource manager. Those jobs are then executed. The daemon monitors the success of the job or its progress, and then when it completes or fails, it reports back to usually a head node, and then uh, you can use commands or the users can use commands or the scheduler can interface with the resource manager to find out um, the success of the job. The resource manager also is, of course, as the name implies, in charge of the resources. It monitors the nodes, their health, their status, um, resource usage, things like that. So Torque is one of many resource managers, um, and it is uh, based on the OpenPBS um, code base, which has been in use for uh, a decade or more now. So, Okay, I wonder if you could give us um, – so, so you mentioned OpenPBS there. I wonder if you could give us a little bit of a history because there is a bit of a tangled history of, of where all these resource managers come from and who inherited code from what and what ideas. And then there was a – a bit of a split within this code base itself and whatnot. So could you give us the, the, the history of Torque? Yeah, I'll do my best. Um, I won't go into all the details as I've heard them because it's quite lengthy and probably boring, but Torque, uh, as I mentioned, came from OpenPBS, and OpenPBS was, de- uh, was uh, designed and created several years ago by, by NASA, Ames Laboratory, and a few other organizations like Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Um, Viridian Software was also involved. They were a contractor that worked on the Open uh, Open PBS source code, um, helping those organizations create Open PBS. And uh, Viridian Software was then acquired by Altair. Well, um, Altair has the commercial rights to distributing uh, Open PBS, and therefore they have the PBS Pro product that is a commercial closed source version of you know the PBS or portable batch scheduler. Um, but Torque comes from OpenPBS, and that license on OpenPBS was uh, liberal enough that allowed um, uh, people to redistribute it, essentially. So Torque came about because uh, over the years, several organizations, uh, lots of organizations, lots of users, had uh, created patches against OpenPBS to make it more scalable, to fix problems, to uh, add new features, things like that. And there were so many patches out there that it really built up to, uh, you know, Dave Jackson, um, who I work with, said it was hundreds of patches. And so there were websites you could go to that would explain how to get OpenPBS up to the latest and greatest, but there were very convoluted directions, like go here and install these five patches, then uh, go and install this patch. But don't install this patch next unless you, you know, want to work out conflicts. So it was really, really complicated. So cluster resources or... uh, probably supercluster.org at the time, um, started to gather all these patches together and apply them to OpenPBS, and we then started to release this product that uh, we eventually named Torque. So Torque is actually a free product right now. Like You can just go to the Cluster Resources website or Supercluster and uh, actually download the uh, Torque and build it and use it without any licensing needs, correct? That's right. It's open source, and there's uh, there's really no re- re- distribution um, limitations, so it's totally free as in beer and free as in uh, speech. 
Okay, but just to clarify, because I, I do work for corporate overlords here, there are licensing restrictions. It's just that they're very liberal, right? That's so correct. Yeah, there there is a license on it. Yeah, um, it, they are very liberal. Mm-hmm. It's not public domain, in other words. Okay, and so you know, just to uh, you know, what what are some of the differences? So, if you both came from kind of a common code base, PBS Pro and Torque, what what are kind of the differences between them today? Other than the fact that you know one is you know a paid commercial support model and whatnot, but are are there significant feature differences between the two? Uh, between PBS Pro and Torque, you said. Yes. Yes, there are. Um, I'm not an expert on PBS Pro, uh, but from what I understand. As time has gone on, they, there are more and more features that have been put into PBS Pro that are not in Torque and vice versa. For example, um, PBS Pro, they have a, they have a new way, way of managing resources called virtual nodes. And it allows you to have more flexibility in, in controlling some of the resources. Um, they also have other features that uh, um, allow you to – oh, what's the word? allow you to better, uh, yeah, I guess, better define resources that are available, like generic resources. Kind of like, uh, I don't know, in Maui or Moab, which are schedulers that work with Torque and other resource managers, you have this concept of generic resources, which represent uh, entities that are not processes or memory that you can schedule against, and PBS Pro is support for that. Uh, Torque, uh, it has um, kind of diverged or has features that PBS Pro doesn't have in the sense that it has um, high availability features now. It has um, a lot of features that the community have asked for in, for example, having a similar generic resource feature set um, or also improving the scalability, changing the way the communication works, things like that. So quick question then. Um, so Torque itself does not come with a scheduler and you always have to hook it up to an external scheduler or does it actually come with a scheduler? No, it actually does come with a scheduler. Um, PBS underbar sched is what we call it. Uh, it's a very simple scheduler. Um, by default, it's FIFO. And there are other uh, plugins that come with the Torque source code that you can use to alter the scheduling behavior. Do many people actually use that scheduler? Um, no. Okay. I think that some people do, but the vast majority of the people we interact with, and maybe we're biased because Cluster Resources has a scheduler product, most of the people we come in contact with do not use PBS Get at all. Okay, so this is actually a great lead-in. Could you give me a, a crystal clear distinction? Because I, I, this is something that is frequently lost on most users. What exactly is the distinction between the scheduler and the resource manager? And, and you mentioned uh, Maui and Moab earlier. I wonder if you could you know, classify that in your, in your definition there. Yeah, so the, the resource manager, this is the way I was explaining it to people. The resource manager are, are the hands and the eyes uh, and I guess you could say the feet of a cluster so, uh, for the software layer. So the resource manager, um, it, like I said, it watches nodes. It, it makes sure it understands the uh, availability of nodes, you know, their status, either up or they're down, their resource usage, things like that. It also will actually start the job and monitor the jobs. It will cancel the job. So it handles all of those processes um, that are started or are required by uh, either serial or parallel jobs. So it does all of the lower level work that requires it to interact directly with operating systems and environments to manage jobs and resources. The scheduler, on the other hand, is at a higher level. It communicates only with the resource manager, usually, and um, it tells the uh, resource manager where to start the jobs and when to start the jobs. And it, so it'll prioritize workload or jobs that people submit and decide um, based on policies that have been configured who should get what share of a cluster or supercomputer. Um, so going along with the analogy of the, so the resource managers, the feet, the eyes, the hands, the scheduler would then be the brains that orchestrates everything. Okay, so if Bob and Sally and Sue all submit jobs, the scheduler is the one who, who actually decides who gets to run right now and, and where, right? Exactly. Okay, and so could you describe then what Maui and Moab are and what the differences are between those? Yeah, so Mo Maui and Moab are both uh, schedulers and policy, policy engines. So when I uh, say that, I mean they, they do more than just schedule. They also enforce a whole bunch of different policies to meet business goals or goals that you may have on your cluster. So Maui is an open source version of – well, it's an open source product, I should say. And um, it supports major scheduling features such as advanced reservations, backfill, 
um, priority, fair share, things like that. And it's very popular when people want a pure open source or a cheaper solution. They'll install Torque and then they'll install Maui and um, they'll be able to manage most, uh, you know, small or modest uh, needs HPC resources. Moab, on the other hand, is a commercial product that Cluster Resources sells. Um, and it uh, is very similar to Maui um, at the beginning, but it is much more advanced than Maui. So it's closed source, and like I said, it is a commercial product, uh, and it has uh, the same features and capabilities of Maui, but it goes above and beyond that. Um, so it's a traditional HPC scheduler. It does also have those that policy engine that I mentioned earlier, um, but it can also do grids, so that's uh, a cluster of clusters, essentially, um, it can also do a lot of data center and workflow uh, uh, management, so managing complex dependencies, things like that. So I won't go in, uh, into all the details, but hopefully that's a good enough introduction into the two products I mentioned. No, that that was very good. Um, Ake, how do you guys use, as an admin at site, how do you guys personally use Torque at your site? Yeah, well, we'll we have a bunch of clusters that we run Torque on. It's basically, as Josh said, just for managing the resources. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, we have everything from, at this time, fairly small 100, 200 node clusters up to 600 node cluster. And, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, what you're saying, um, it's just a, it's just used as, as the resource manager. We also use Maui as the scheduler, of course. Like, I find it fascinating that you uh, you say you know fairly small is uh, one hundred to two hundred nodes, whereas you know a couple yeah. of years ago that would have been uh, holy criminy. That's a really large cluster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I've been around for a while doing this, so. Yeah, yeah. It just it speaks to the state of the tools and and the industry that uh, you know the, the the state of the art has actually advanced into the well. It's pretty common to have hundred, two hundred, three hundred node clusters these days. Yeah. Sorry, just a little editorial oh, remark yeah. there. I assume this is also part of the work that's gone into Torque versus you know since it's diverged from Open PBS is making it work better on these larger systems. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. In the beginning, when we started in around 2002, it was fairly common that Torque crashed and, and jobs failed to start. But today, it's almost flawless in that respect. So, question for you guys: What what are your roles in the project? What do you guys both do in in the Torque project? Well, uh, for me, this is Josh. Um, I, uh, I've, I'm, a, I'm a principal developer here, a software engineer at Cluster Resources. So with Torque, I've actually been involved uh, throughout my tenure here at Cluster Resources. But in the last year and a half, I've taken a more active role of kind of overseeing the development. I, I do do some development in Torque, so I'll, I'll fix bugs, add features, um, and they're usually customer driven. So if we have a customer that has a particular need or bug, then I will, you know, help solve that problem in the source code. But we also have two full time developers here at Cluster Resources and a and a handful of community developers that I kind of help oversee um, and and coordinate between to make sure, uh, you know, that the project's going well. So I guess my my role is more of a manager or overseer of the developers here at Cluster Resources. So, Josh, quick question. Cluster Resources, do they provide support contracts if somebody should want one for Torque? Yes, they do. Um, they do. Usually, so it's, it's kind of odd. If you if you want a support contract for Torque, you essentially buy Moab because you get that free when buying, when buying Moab. And if someone says, well, I don't want Moab. I just want to buy Torque support. We say, oh, well, it's the same price. So you might as well get Moab too. And a lot of people, <laughs> not a lot. I should say there's a handful of people that actually just pay for Maui and Torque support. Um and uh, you know don't even want to use for whatever reasons the our commercial products Moab and the, the other products we have. Okay, so jumping back just a second here. Uh, okay, I, I don't think we heard your answer. What what is your role in the in the Torque project? 
Well, officially nothing, but since I've been around for a while, I have uh, made a couple of patches during the years, uh, mainly memory-related stuff. Uh, we will hopefully sometime uh, get down to, to hand doing some of the Kerberos uh, pieces that are in progress. Okay, so you're a random open source developer that periodically yeah. does a feature that's useful to you. Yeah. Okay. That's the good open source way, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I wonder, uh, here, here's another random question. What, what are some of the more famous sites, uh, um, famous clusters, HPC installations and whatnot that are using Torque? Um, well, the ones that I'm aware of, uh, there's there's tons, um, and we. And it's interesting because we're not even aware of everyone who's using Torque because it's open source, and we don't uh, require people to register to download Torque, um, and it can be redistributed. Um, it's it's hard to pin down everyone who's using it, but we do know some of the more famous sites. Luckily, um, for example, uh, kind of the uh, pride and joy right now is Los Alamos National Laboratory. They have the fastest computer in the world, Roadrunner. Um, a petaflop machine, and it uses Torque. Um, uh, I should say that they are getting Torque to work on it, so they don't use it. Uh, they just barely uh, got control of the machine again, and so we're working with them to get Torque running on it. But they, but they have been using Torque to launch uh, subset of jobs. They haven't yet launched the job for the entire machine, but we're working on that with them. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a as an MPI developer, and I'm the Open MPI guy, and I'm involved with Roadrunner as well. I Know that that is uh, a lot harder than it sounds. It sounds like, yeah. oh, we'll just have a million jobs. What's the problem? Well, that's actually pretty darn complex because it touches just about every aspect of the machine. Yeah, and, and we're getting there, though. We're getting close. So, um, and, and that's the plan for them to use Torque as a resource manager. Um, it's also worthy to mention, I think, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, uh, who has the second largest machine. And uh, they're, they're running Torque on that as well. Um, we also have uh, people in all, you know, not just in HPC. We also have commercial people using Torque. So Exxon Mobil, we have pharmaceutical companies. Uh, pretty much every major university has one or two clusters using Torque. Um, a lot of data centers, for example, Yahoo, they use Torque extensively internally, um, both cool. you know, via Hadoop on demand and also just using a traditional, you know, clusters and uh, data center setups they have there. And so that's an interesting trend, actually, that Torque is being used more and more uh, for data centers and um, not just for your traditional HPC cluster that you usually think of. So that's really cool. So we actually talked to the Hadoop guys uh, a couple of weeks ago on this podcast, and um, I did not realize that Hadoop could be used with Torque. So you actually... Um, can move the computation around to meet where the data is. I mean, that's kind of their whole philosophy, right? So I, I didn't realize that Torque could be used in that kind of context. Yeah, so Hadoop On Demand uses uh, Torque. So just plain Hadoop, which is the file system and the uh, you know MapReduce portion of it, it doesn't use Torque. But Hadoop On Demand, what it does is it uses Torque, which allow to basically schedule a set of nodes or allocate a set of nodes, and there's a scheduler on top of it, and in this, in this case, it's Hadoop or the PBS sched. It will allocate a set of nodes, and then basically a, a mini Hadoop cluster will be created with those nodes. And so Torque helps uh, you know allocate those nodes and, and start the Hadoop processes on them and stuff like that. Okay. So Hadoop is still um, a very like compute intensive kind of thing. It's still like some form of HPC. Do you see more use of uh, Torque? Like you said, for traditional data centers, are you seeing it used for anything? Very outside, like the traditional compute. Uh, no, not very outside. I mean, at at the end of the day, there's there's still a compute job that Torque is starting, and it's usually compute intensive, either you know I/O bound or CPU bound, and uh, it monitors the job, reports back the status, uh, things like that. Um, there has been some work and research done with Torque starting virtual machines. And then, you know, the compute job itself actually runs inside of the virtual machine. But then, but there again, at the end of the day, it's, it's still a compute-intensive job. So uh, Torque isn't doing some, anything too exotic. It still does basically what it was designed to do, but it's 
being done by people that you wouldn't traditionally think as HPC folks. Okay, at so least that's, at least that's my point of view from what I've seen. So, okay, so back on the really large jobs, you mentioned with the uh, Roadrunner that it was really hard to start that many uh, processes at once. That's yeah, the yeah, job uh, of uh, Torque, or is that the job of the MPI launcher, or do those two integrate together? Well, it's kind of the job of both of them. So Torque's job is to, uh, well, the scheduler will determine uh, what nodes Torque should try to grab or allocate to start a job. So Torque will go uh, receive instructions from the scheduler. And, for example, in the example of Roadrunner, it will, say, get a list of uh, 2,880 nodes, uh, which is the largest job to date that we've started on Roadrunner. And um, Torque will then... uh, go out and talk to all of the daemons running out on the compute nodes, uh, those 2,880 nodes. And um, we'll try to get them all to answer back to uh, the main compute node and say, okay, we're all ready to start. We're, already, we're all together. We're all in a group. And once that has happened, so we, we call that a join, where they all come together. Once that's happened, then the head compute node, which is called the Mother Superior, um, it starts the script that is submitted by the user, and it's usually. <laughs> Hold on a second, script. I got I got to interrupt you here. You got to explain the term "mother superior" there. Okay, yeah, I thought you were going to ask about that. So, <laughs> yeah. so um, the daemons that run out on the compute nodes are called PBS underbar mom, and mom stands for machine oriented uh, mini server. I don't know why that's called that, but that's traditionally what it's been called. So, um, somewhere along the line, someone decided to use. Uh, Catholic, Catholic nunneries as the nomen, naming, nomenclature for the different part of PBS mom. So you have your mother superior, which is in charge of a, uh, a group of sisters or a convent. And so if you're the, the, the main compute nodes called the mother superior and the other compute nodes in that group for that job are called sisters. And uh, I don't know what the historical reason for that is, but that's the way it is. And we just, we continue to use that, uh, that nomenclature now. So, <laughs> okay. So yeah, the Mother Superior is the head compute node. It it gathers all of its sisters together and, and the sister group. And once they've all joined and are, are ready to participate in the job, um, then the Mother Superior will run the script submitted by the user. And that script usually has an MPI run or an MPI exec in it. And then at that point, uh, Torque will pass in the host list to MPI and MPI will then go up, do its wire up, and we'll actually start the job that, that does the actual uh, compute interesting stuff. So it actually does the computation. Yeah, and this is, this kind of veers straight into my land as well, where you have uh, you know Open MPI or, or a couple of others, or even some third party start ons like uh, the uh, the MPI Exec project out of the Ohio Supercomputing Center. They actually use an AP, a Torque API to start processes on the other nodes, as opposed to say RSH or SSH. So. Uh, things work yeah, for a variety of uninteresting reasons. They work a little better that way when you use the resource manager to start all the individual MPI processes rather than RSH, SSH. Yeah, exactly. And that API is called the TM interface or the task manager interface. Um, and as uh, Jeff mentioned, OpenMPI has native support for that when you compile it correctly, if I understand right. And this MPI exec is a wrapper for many popular MPI tools that the Ohio Supercomputing Center created. Um, it's a very valuable tool. So, yeah, it's unfortunately named because MPI exec uh, that 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 word is overloaded in in several different cases. So you say, oh, we'll use MPI exec. Well, which MPI exec do you mean? <laughs> yeah, you always have to preface different... it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, do you, do you know, Jeff? What came first? Was it OSC's MPI exec or MPI exec from the MPI industry? Uh, MPI exec from the MPI standard. That's why Ohio Supercomputing chose that name. I see. But then it becomes confusing because several MPI implementations, including OpenMPI, we include our own MPI exec, which is completely and wholly different than the Ohio State Supercomputing MPI exec wrapper for TM. A little bit of a little bit of MPI history there for you. Yeah. A little, little extra for you. So let me ask you this. Uh, it's a, perhaps a little bit of a leading question here. Um, during this uh, whole startup dance here with MPI and TM and so on, um, the, uh, the comparisons that as an MPI guy I hear sometimes are like, well, geez, you know, I can, I can TM launch 
uh, been true at uh, you know half a second across a, a billion nodes, why does it take MPI so much longer to start up um, in doing that? So can I can I throw that leading question over to you? Do you know? It's because the MPI guys aren't as good as Twerk. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. That's the perfect answer, yeah. No, no, I'm just kidding. Um, Well, it's got to do with... uh, MPI is much more advanced in its uh, communication mesh, from what I understand. So I would assume that the wire-up for MPI is uh, much more involved because once you have... Because you've got to get the wire-up just right. Because after the wire-up's done just right, the communication is going to be much, much faster than it would be trying to do a linear communication, you know, using the the, the Torque compute daemons, so the PBS moms. Um, right, yeah, also, I didn't mean this as a quiz question, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, oh, yes, that's pretty right. Yeah, so that's that's my understanding. And, and, and also MPI has to, you have to deal with network interfaces, you know, you have InfiniBand, you've got all kinds of things to worry about. It's a much more complex problem. Yeah, we, we basically have to exchange all this metadata um, during it's usually during MPI init, so that you know when you do an MPI send or whatever, we can open the Q pair, we can open the socket, we can open the shared memory, whatever you know is necessary. So there's a whole pile of additional information that has to be exchanged during MPI init after the process has already started, and just that volume of data just takes time to transmit across the network. Yeah, but like I said, after it's the wire up's done, um, you're able to be much more efficient. So we're doing a broadcast. You know, is going yep. to use a, a login uh, based thing rather than a linear. So, yeah, and little known fact too for for most MPI implementations, this is true as well that the first time you do an MPI send, it's a little bit slow because we usually have to establish the connection, and then after that, the the connection is established and, and things go much faster. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to drag us off into the weeds here of MPI things, but since MPI frequently interacts with Torque. Uh, this is this is a common question that we get asked. Well, why is MPI startup different than process startup? So, there's a couple other advantages of starting up processes under TM. Um, most notably, I tend to use Torque sometimes to monitor resource usage by um, even a parallel job. When instead, if it's started by SSH RSH, I actually lose track of the resources consumed by the uh, like the different MPI ranks out there. If it started under TM. Torque kind of keeps track of all that for me, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. And the reason it can is because it's an actual child of the PBS mom, Damon, a child process. So it's able to monitor. Um, it knows the PID, first of all. So it's able to monitor its resource usage through the operating system using that PID. But it can also know exactly when the, the job completes uh, by calling wait PID. And it can also get resource information directly from the operating system because it's its parent. So, uh, yeah, there are, there are benefits and most, and that's why MPI will usually uh, spawn their processes under TM spawn. You can also kill off the uh, the ranks out there if they run over wall clock or something a lot easier instead of having zombie jobs kind of floating out there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, definite definite advantage with RSH and SSH. You can end up with these zombie jobs because there is no firm control, but something like Torque can exert positive and complete control over. Oh, you. You know your your MPI job crashed. Well, we'll make sure to clean up all the all the processes for you, so that those nodes are clean and ready for a new job. Okay, let's let's move on to how Torque is uh, developed. Um, you said it's open. H- how can other people get involved with uh, working on Torque, or if they have a patch they've came up with in house and they want to submit it back? How can they do that? Well, what's what's what's, what's been your experience, Aki? Yeah, well, it's fairly easy. <laughs> Create a patch, make sure it works, send it upstream, and Garrett will usually take care of it. So who's Garrett? Uh, I keep forgetting his full name. Uh, Garrett uh, Staples is his full name. Yeah. Uh, uh, Garrett is, is an open source, uh, well, I mean, a community developer. Um, he's been very involved in Torque and uh from from once from since it began uh called torque he's been very involved um he is out of the university of southern california and he's one of their admins there and so in order to make his job easier he started hacking on torque to make it do what he wanted to do improve it and you know he's been involved in the community and because of that i i hear that um his cluster runs really well now <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So 
so he's always uh, he's always very helpful to the community. And, and like Ake said, um, if you have a patch, Garrick will probably look at it, either reject it or accept it, and then uh, check yeah. it in. Okay, it, since I'm an open source developer m- myself, it, it's always very interesting to me to hear how other projects run. I mean, do you guys have, is there kind of a, a governance panel, or is it true, you know, distributed, open source, send an email, send a patch, and, and that's it? Or is there an upper level, you know, someone who sets roadmaps and what kind of features are going to go in in the future and things like that? Or, you know, how do you, how do you guys run yourselves? Well, it is, uh, it's, there's no governing panel. Um, <coughs> Cluster Resources does sponsor Torque. So um, oftentimes we will gather together requirements, either from our customers or from the community, and we, will, we, we try to present them to the community through the mailing list, um, which is the main uh, method of communication between us and the community and users and so forth. Um, and we, we try to come up with you know, common goals that we all want to achieve, and then some people in the open source community or in the, in the Torque community, I should say, will go out and develop some of those. CRI will tackle a few of them, and uh, we try to achieve those goals. So it's pretty loosey-goosey. Um, there's, no, there's no real governance panel, no voting, no president, none, nothing like that yet. Um, we also have supercomputing and other conferences where we will meet face-to-face. We traditionally have a birds of a feather, a boff at supercomputer, supercomputing, uh, conference here in the U.S., which uh, you we usually fill up an entire room of people interested in Torah that have comments or suggestions or just want to hear what's happening the next year. So, um, as we're getting patches submitted, you usually submit a patch to the mailing list, and one of the committers will pick up on it and uh, will evaluate it um, if it's good. It, you know, there might be more discussion about it. More changes might need to be made. But if it's really good, um, usually we just be checked in to uh, either the stable branch, if it's safe enough, or to the development branch. So, so on the, on the community model there, what do you guys do for uh, both QA and for licensing? Like you, you mentioned specifically committers out there, which means that you must have a, a small set of designated super committer kinds of, of people if they uh, you know you guys have done the licensing stuff all properly and then how do you do the QA do you do you know distributed testing does everybody test it or is it kind of a it works for me and it doesn't work or it doesn't fail for other people so that's good or what do you, what do you guys do there um, well uh, traditionally it's been more of a uh, distributed testing so um, Here's a patch. Try it out. Some people will try it. They all report back it worked well, so then we'll check it in. Um, but we're trying to be more formalized in that now because more people are being involved, both CRI developers and community developers. Um, quality assurance is, of course, a big deal. So we will we will usually do uh, quote-unquote beta testing. So we will announce we want to release a version of Torque, and we'll encourage people to download the latest snapshots to run it through their clusters. And a lot of people are actually pretty open to doing that and are willing to help out in these testing. Um, Sometimes it's just out of the goodness of their heart or out of curiosity. Other times it's because we've embedded a carrot in Torque, such as a feature that they really want to try out. And so (laughs) they will uh, um, try out the software, let us know how it goes. And we, we also have a couple at CRI, a couple friendly sites that are quite large. Um, that will that are willing to install early builds for us and you know help us get that scalability testing in there as well, um, and the community of course does its own testing uh, for features that they think are important or for their own branches that they're working on. So uh, that's kind of how quality assurance goes. One one final question on community stuff. I, I always have to ask, what version control software are you guys using? Uh, right now we're using Subversion. So you're able to anonymously check out, um, but of course check-ins are restricted right now to keep some sanity to the project. Um, yeah, we're using Subversion 1.3, I think. Okay, so community-supported features and uh, other features. What are some of the features that have been added to Torque? Um, you mentioned a couple of the GRES and stuff. What's some of the more recent features that have been added to Torque that someone who's been using it for a while but not keeping up on it might find useful? Um, well, recently we've added, uh, well, this is about a year ago, but it's still pretty recent, I think, is a high availability feature which allows you to run two PBS servers, one of them which is active and the other which is uh, inactive. So when the active one goes down, is you know either crashes or is killed or the machine it's running on shuts down, the inactive one is able to start up and uh, take over the workload and resource management. 
So, it, you know, it, it's a, uh, I guess it's a first step in helping make Torque more uh, highly available or have a failover feature. The reason I say a first step is because it's not perfect. It right now is based on an NFS file locking, so there are some limitations. Um, some of the other features we've added are um, some minor things such as uh, log management. So Torque really didn't have a way of rolling or uh, cleaning up logs by itself. Of course, the community's uh, advice is to use something like Log Rotate, but for some of our customers, that isn't an option. Other features that we have done have been really to increase the, sta- the scalability and stability. So, like Ake mentioned, Torque in the early days used to be horrible. You know, jobs would just, well, not horrible, but it was not as good as it is now. It would often, you know, jobs would often fail for no reason. Um, jobs would get stuck in states like running or E for indefinite amounts of time. And we've really tightened up some of those protocol uh, issues or communication problems that would lead to those sorts of bad states or jobs failing. So um, we've really been trying to focus on that, just making it really tight uh, and work well. And the last thing, I guess, that we've really focused on over the last year is performance. So how many jobs it can start per second, um, how fast you can run commands, how fast you can submit jobs into Torque, things like that. One of the uh, features that came out recently that we've gotten actually a lot of mileage out, and I know it's not complete yet. I know Glenn still has quite a bit he wanted to do with it, but it was a job arrays that was added. Um, that's actually been very useful for a number of our users. Yeah, and I didn't mention it because Glenn always, he's always, you know, he's, he's really good. He wants to make sure that people know that it's still a work in progress and not to bet your, you know, your farm on it so <laughs> yeah well it's working great i mean if glenn's gonna listen to this i mean uh let him know that the thing's working great so far so yeah a lot of people use that and, and that it, that's that's one of our uh, performance enhancing things we're able to you know get a, a thousand to two thousand jobs in the queue very quickly as opposed to waiting you know a few minutes uh future features then uh Ake, you mentioned kerberos what what exactly is the state with that I'm not sure. The last thing I saw about it was more than half a year ago, I think. Uh, Josh? Um, Well, yeah, CRI, or Cluster Resources, um, we haven't been directly, our developers have not been directly involved in the Kerberos Mm -hmm. development. It's been more community-driven, so... Yeah. yeah, I think the last thing I saw was somewhere about six months ago. But what what's really needed here is for us AFS users to to get AFS tokens into the to the moms. Oh, this is an AFS question. Yes, I remember uh, yeah. struggling with AFS support many years ago when I was a graduate student at Notre Dame using Open PBS, and there was a third party tool written by Dale Southard, and I'm forgetting the name of it, but he had it a way to um, securely pass the tokens in and out. Um, uh, what was the name of that tool? I don't remember. What what uh, what kind of approach are you guys going to take? Do you know? I'm not sure. I was intending to 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 look into this last year, but other things got in between. Uh, but to do this safely, you really need to rewrite parts of the communication layer in in uh, Torque. So it's not that easy to, to do it in the current state. Okay. And so this is mainly an AFS issue, not necessarily just plain vanilla Kerberos. Well, if you get if you do it right, it will solve all the Kerberos related problems. But okay. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so things so, like so NFS v4 that use Kerberos yeah. or like a Kerberized like um, WAN style luster systems or something like that that are all saying they're going to be secured using Kerberos. To be able to use those file systems easily, if the resource manager could pass tickets for the user, it'd make things a lot simpler. Yeah. Precisely. I do know that uh, there was, like Ake mentioned, there has been work on in the past in the community, envir- uh, the community, and um, I'm trying to remember someone's name. I think MIT. Yeah, yeah uh, Stockholm University is also involved. Yeah, there's there's a branch basically right now in Torque. I don't know how well it's being maintained. That is what was created to try to Kerberize Torque. So, yeah. 
Um, there has been work on it in the past. I don't know. Like I said, it's community driven, so I don't know how things are going right now. I haven't heard a lot of activity on it recently. So, but I know at one point it was possible to pass these tokens around in an AFS file system, and uh, that things were working at least with very crude initial tests. So, yeah. Okay. So, so what else is uh, in the future? What what else is on tap for Torque? What makes Torque go to eleven? Um, well, uh, from a cluster resources perspective, um, we've gotten a lot of requests at last supercomputing to have better support for CPU sets um, and also uh, scheduling of cores. So actually, you know, supporting the core affinity features in Linux and other operating systems and pinning jobs to cores since, uh, you know, cores are uh, really big in clusters now. Um, so that's something that uh, some of the community is working on. Um, and also here in CRI, uh, we hope to get some uh, core pinning, core affinity, um, or or or, uh, or uh, processor affinity for that matter. Um, oh, great, because I, I have some very definite opinions about that as an MPI guy. Great. Yeah. Good to hear. So um, also, we are really interested in scalability. So as we mentioned earlier um, with Roadrunner, uh, it's been a uh, you know, learning experience getting Torque to scale up that large. Uh, but it has gone well. Most of the problems thus far have actually been... Uh, network configuration issues on Roadrunner, from what I understand. But we, we do recognize that once, uh, you know, you have a million-node cluster out there, um, Torque's not going to be able to scale to that with its current communication model. Now, right, right now, it's quite linear. So we hope to um, have an alternate communication model in Torque that's tree-based, um, very similar to how OpenMPI does things. Uh, we've worked with Ralph Castain, who's also an OpenMPI developer, to kind of come up with some ideas and to figure out how OpenMPI has tackled some of these problems. Um, so we want to do that, the, the, the tree communication, both for the resource manager part, so just nodes reporting back status, and also for uh, the wiring up of jobs. Not the wiring up of MPI per se, but the wiring up of the communication between the sisters. Um, also, if we're lucky... And this is this is pretty far out there, so we'll see how how well it goes. But um, if we're lucky, uh, Ralph is interested in working with us uh, and Open MPI, I would assume, to actually have Torque participate in the wire up of MPI. So that's yes, actually, I've, uh, Ralph has talked to me quite a bit about that, and uh, boy, that that sounds great. We would we would love this kind of stuff. We've we've wanted this kind of stuff from resource managers for long, long, long time, and uh, it would be great for it to actually finally materialize so yeah i agree it's it's still kind of far out but something that we're we're actually fairly excited about in open mpi yeah and so other things uh, other future future things for torque is i know i personally would like to see the torque source code cleaned up more um it has made a lot of good progress a lot more comments are in the code now it was kind of designed by committee that's the feeling i get looking back you can see there's multiple authors with multiple you know styles of coding and old, old pre C functions and things like that, you know, bringing it more modern, more, more fresh, more up-to-date, that will help uh, it be easier to maintain and also weed out some of the bugs that have been lurking in there for years. Um, Remove and, all uh, the old COBOL from the code base and, and Lisp. Yeah, well, I don't, <laughs> I don't know if there's any COBOL or Lisp, but, <laughs> but there's definitely maybe that style of programming in there, yeah, so... Um, you know, gotcha. make it consistent and nice. And uh, like I said, just tighten down the communication and the state machine just to make it rock solid. And it really is much more solid than it was. And, and some people do say it's rock solid. It never fails for them. Kind of like Ake said, it's, it's flawless usually. But there are the occasional um, clusters that just beat the snot out of torque and will uncover some flaws. So we want to fix it completely. Yeah, as from an admin perspective, some of those... Uh managing of resources like we've been wanting to use torque on an sgi altic shared memory machine for a while and to get the full cpu set integration and now that cpu sets are a linux 2.6 thing and less of a altix only thing uh admins of just pizza box style systems the multi-core can take more advantage of that also a different type of resource that's becoming more common are like these compute peripherals uh gpus uh, we talked to a gpu project on this uh show early on and things like ASICs and stuff, is there any look for, is that a job for Torque, or is that a job for the scheduler? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know, Ake, do you have any insight on that? Yeah, well, it's it's a resource. It should be managed. It's in the resource manager. <laughs> so, depends on what, you, what your point of view is, but uh, you need to, to 
handle those resources, just like CPUs and memory. So Torque needs to handle it, I think. Yeah, I think there's, I think this is a twofold thing here. I think that Torque doesn't need to be well. First of all, it's a scheduler. From a schedule perspective, you can actually probably uh, schedule and manage these accessories just fine. Um, for example, if you're using Maui or Moab, you can create a generic resource uh, which would define those GPUs. So, say you have a cluster and each node has you know two or three GPUs installed on it. So each node has three GPU. Uh, generic resources or widgets that you can schedule. So when someone launches a job, they can request one of those GPUs, then Moab will tell Torque, or Maui will tell Torque to start uh, the job on that node because it knows it has a free GPU, and then when the job actually starts, it will you know contact the GPU and do its computation on there. But the, the second part is uh, Torque may need to be aware of the GPU and its resource utilization, its usage, and things like that to get meaningful statistics and also to uh, to avoid the scheduler getting confused maybe about overcommitting or about someone actually submitting a job outside of the batch system and running it on the GPU, things like that. Those are kind of some of the issues that we've seen, at least with uh, our customers and users that are using GPUs in uh, HPC environment. So, yeah, right now the way we do it, we wrap around a lot of, uh, we do a lot of stuff in epilogue and prologue, and kind of mess with the environment to be able to have users know which GPU they're actually supposed to have been assigned. Um, but it, it works pretty well. It'd just be nicer to see it a little like integrated out of the box. Yeah, and I, I, I totally agree. I think that's. Uh, it seems to me that GPUs and these other accelerators are. Uh, I mean, they're not going away. They're going to become more and more dominant. Um, and so it would behoove us to learn more about them and to integrate better with them. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, guys. This was this was a lot of fun. Um, again, we have Josh Budikofer from Cluster Resources and Ake Sengren from HPC Two A. Thanks a lot for taking some time out for us, guys. Thanks for your time, guys. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.